Då är det dags att byta ämne. Och jag ska hälsa alla välkomna både i publiken här på bokmässan och ni som tittar på Facebook eller på webben i Globala torgets sändningar här från bokmässan. Och temat nu det blir Ukraina. Jag heter Inga Näslund och arbetar som är Östeuropaansvarig på Olof Palmes internationella centrum som center som också har en, ett, en, ett stånd där ute på Globala torget och ni kan ta reda på mer om oss där sen om ni vill. Men som en gäst idag och det här samtalet kommer att bli på engelska. We will speak English. Uh, we have a most honored guest from Ukraine today, Andrei Kur Kurkov. Uh, he is the chairman of the Ukrainian Pen Club. Uh, you, I think you, everyone knows what the Pen Club is. Maybe Andrei ca also can tell a little bit about that. But uh, tell us, you came from, I know you came from Norway yesterday, but you normally live in Kiev. Well, I have been living in Kiev since I was two years old. Actually, I was born in Leningrad region, and then my family moved to my grandma, who lived in Kiev. And uh, yeah, uh, actually, I was in Kiev with my wife when the war started. Our children were in Lviv in Western Ukraine. And then we slowly moved to Western Ukraine to Uzhgorod on the border with Slovakia. And from there, from beginning of March, I started traveling to either to Slovakia by car to the airport or to Bayamare to Romania and uh, uh, just taking part in different events and explain what is happening in Ukraine, which I'm still doing and uh, I'm sure I will be doing this until the very end of the year. And you have been a writer for a very long time. I know you have uh, written a lot of books. Uh, tell a little bit about your 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 work. There are children books and novels. Well, and I started writing poetry when I was at se seven years old. When I was 13, then somebody told me that the writers don't go to work. They stay at home. And I decided to become a writer. And I, Clever. I, <laughs> yes, but I became a professional writer only in... 1997, at the age of 36, when I signed my first proper contract. But I have been writing prose uh, pr from the age of 17. And I, by now I published 25 novels, 12 books for children. I wrote scripts fil for films, so plays, etc. And uh, my uh, latest published in translation novel is called The Grey Bees. It's about beekeeping in Donbass during the war. And uh, it was, it will be published in March in Swedish. It's published already in Iran, in uh, England, America, Europe, etc. Uh, and uh, the next book in Swedish is my diary of invasion, a collection of my essays about the war, uh, written from December last year till 15th of July. And uh, your children's books, we have a we have a copy here, and yeah, uh, they are hard to get in Swedish, I think. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, no, you can find them actually. The first one is called "Why the," uh, I don't, I cannot Egen tell you. Uh, yeah, Egen why, why Kotten. nobody uh, stalks uh, <laughs> Hedgehog? It's about Hedgehog uh, things that nobody loves him, and this is the second book. It's published uh, in Stockholm, and uh, it's illustrated by my old friend and illustrator who moved from Ukraine to Stockholm, Tanya Garushina. Ah. And you can find it actually in, in uh, Sweden. Uh, I know that in all libraries and children's departments the, they have this, it. This animal is of course really popular in Sweden. We have, we have them. They are, small, they are sometimes hard to find, but they are very popular. Anyway, uh, Pen Club, tell us a couple of words about uh, Pen Club. In uh, What is it well, and what do you do in Ukraine? Well, International Pen was started in London in uh, 1921, I think, by Bernard Shaw and by the most famous English writers who wanted actually to unite to fight for the freedom of expression and for human rights. And since then, there are 140 centers all around the world uh, in each country. Sometimes there are two or three centers in one country. And it's actually, it's not about promotion of books, but it's promotion of rare languages, of languages from which very little is translated. And it's about freedom of expression and human rights. And Ukrainian PEN exists from 1990, but active is from 2015. 
Uh, in the beginning of the war, uh, we were very active. We were running several projects, uh, including trips of young writers all around Ukraine to organize public discussions and uh, different uh, political and literary events. Uh, but uh, from the beginning of the war, we started collecting money to help refugee writers. We have refugee writers in Ukraine from 2014, when writers from Lugansk and Don Donetsk region had to flee. Uh, one of the best Russian language writers in Ukraine from Donetsk, Vladimir Rafeenko, he is now for the second time refugee, and he made a statement that he will never write a word in Russian again, so mm. he started writing in Ukrainian. We, I mean, we are a very dynamic country, and of course, I mean, the Writers' Society is very dynamic, and not so easy to uh, manage, because as any Ukrainian, uh, writers have, each one has his own or her own opinion, but uh, we managed to collect money to help uh, writers in Ukraine and, and who went outside. And we started uh, in English Facebook dialogues about the war with international writers. You can find them on YouTube and on Ukrainian Pen website. And we had uh, conversations with Philip Sands. Uh, Margaret Atwood, Orhan Pamuk, and many, many other international names. Also now, I mean, the cultural and literary life resumed in a way in Ukraine. We have regularly book presentations in bomb shelters and in metro, uh, rock concerts also. But all, I mean, now in the last week we started uh, doing the offline and not bomb shelter uh, uh, literary events uh, in the offices of Ukrainian Pen Club in Podil. It's a Jewish quarter of Kiev, very beautiful historical uh, district. Very nice. I know that you also have a close cooperation with the Swedish Pen Club, yep. which of course also exists and also helps a lot with refugee writers, as I understand. Well, I, I should say that actually Swedish, Norwegian and Danish Pen Clubs, they were the first to contact us and ask us if we need help. And oh, we had a lot good. of help. And Swedish president of PEN was recently in uh, Ukraine for the secret meeting of uh, PEN presidents of, from Eastern Europe, which was held in Uzhgorod on oh, the border. Oh, that was with, yeah. great. Yeah. I, uh, that's Jesper Bengtsson, and I, 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 I know him. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what we, we have put as a theme for this talk is uh, how to be, how the free... Uh, word have the uh, the the uh, freedom for for journalists and writers works in the time of war, um, and I asked you when we talked before here is 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 it uh, something that worries the writers of Ukraine now the s war situation the war laws and so there are special laws in in power now. Well, I mean there are no laws about censorship or special rule during the war. So actually. In Ukraine, it is dangerous to impose censorship because the civil society is very strong and all politicians are afraid of the street demonstrations. And we had already two Maidans, which influenced the situation in politics to the best from my mind. And now, I mean, what is happening now that many prosa writers stopped writing novels and are they are writing, like me, essays and articles and texts. Uh, the poets continued to write poems but, uh, I mean, writers are doing mostly journalistic work, and journalists, uh, I mean, they are doing what they used to do, but of course, uh, I think there is some kind of not censorship, but self-control, even not self-censorship, because, of course, when you have a war, there are people who believe in victory and people who are sure that we will lose. And so, I mean, if somebody is in doubt of Ukrainian victory, uh, of course, he can, can be harassed and hated, and, uh, and we had, I mean, we had, uh, due to Ukrainian democracy, we had pro-Russian political parties active in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. We had pro-Russian newspapers, TV channels. And, uh, I mean, this is a big issue now. Because still, I mean, still you can uh, open websites which are run by pro-Russian activists who say that they are ex-pro-Russian. Now they are pro-Ukrainian. Uh, but, uh, I mean, th they are trying to be cautious. Uh, th this kind of people, but uh, but what uh, uh, I want to add that uh, the main media now is not uh, uh, newspapers or websites or television. It's internet. It's uh, mm. it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Telegram, and so most of 
active and young people, uh, they are taking the information from these sources. What is special in the time of the war that actually the government and official media, they don't want to give us bad information about the front from the front lines. So we can only guess uh, what kind of losses Ukraine have. But we have information about uh, how many fighter planes were shot, uh, Russian fighter planes shot, how many Russians were captured, etc. So we have the victory related information. Be sure we are, I am following it very closely, those numbers. Yeah. Uh, well, I, um, I know that uh, we talk about the fog of war and it's hard to, to uh, uh, be assured of facts because there is a lot of, of fog around the war. I know, I saw this, that the, there is a rule that you have to wa wait at least 24 hours to tell about even about small victories and so on. And this is because, of course, of the security issues yeah. for, for those who are fighting so that they are not reading on the internet where they are and so on. So that I think everyone understands that. The, this is not censorship in, uh, this is the clever, to be clever in, in, in the situation of war. But this war has maybe uh, more than most wars in history been a war of propaganda and the war of uh, culture uh, because on the other side, the enemy, they have absolutely no limitations in lying and uh, uh, have their own reality. Um, but I know that maybe you are not, I mean, yeah, I know you follow, of course, what happening, what's happening in Moscow also, but I mean, it's, it's, it's like in a bizarre other world uh, they live on another planet, I would say. <laughs> uh, but how do you how do you treat that? Are the people in Ukraine, when you see pro-Russian, are they trying to to say those truths from Moscow also to Ukrainian people? That must be laughable. I mean, the propaganda that Moscow. No, I think Mo Moscow propaganda is not working anymore at all. Oh. And even if we talk about uh, Russian-speaking population, and actually I'm ethnic Russian, so I write mostly in Russian, although I write non-fiction also in Ukraine and in English. But uh, uh, in, before the time, maybe up to 20% uh, of Ukrainians, mostly Russian speakers, would vote for pro-Russian political parties. Mm. I think this is in the past. And of course, I mean, the more stupid lies and uh, false narratives Russia was producing about Ukraine, the less support they even had among people who previously were Russophiles and wanted actually uh, to have more close ties to, mm. with Russia. Everyone is saying that this is one of Putin's biggest uh, uh, successes, to bring Ukraine together as never before. Well, I mean, he was trying hard from the 2005, from Orange okay. Revolution, actually this is the third time the nation of individualists is consolidated by the by, by the common enemy. Yes. So, so, but I mean, you, we should remember that Ukrainians have Ukrainians have different mentality than Russians. Russians from the 12th century they have collective mentality. It was always a monarchy. So they loved their tsars. When they were not happy with the tsar, they would kill one tsar and love the next one. And for them, actually, collective responsibility or collective lack of responsibility is very traditional. Ukrainians are individualists. Everyone has his own or her own opinion what the country should look like. That's why actually we have 40 million different Ukrainians in the heads of 40 million Ukrainians. And uh, the border between collective Soviet Russian mentality and Ukrainian individualist was cut in Ukraine in half 20 years ago. But now it moved very close to Russian border. And if we didn't have a war, uh, I think in 20 years' time, the borders would coincide. So the border with Russia would be border with between two mentalities. And then uh, Putin would have no chance, actually, to have even slightest support from Ukrainian population in his plans to incorporate Ukraine into a new Russian empire. And as he behaved now with uh, the uh, atrocities uh, that are uh, uncovered, especially when, when you liberate. Well, this is a revenge, actually. And mm. what is uh, tragic that uh, people who are killed by Russian soldiers, military, and secret services are people in whose smartphones they find either the texts, pro-Ukrainian uh, pieces of information or images, or the photographs of a Russian 
tanks, etc., because they immediately think that these, these were passed to Ukrainian army. So, I mean, whenever Russian army comes to a village, they check smartphones of everybody and then take away those in whose smartphones they find something either patriotic or something that makes them believe that uh, this person is in the form of a Ukrainian army. This must be the first war when smartphones p play uh, such a uh, central role, I would say. Well, I mean, it is a very strange. I mean, it's a hybrid war if mm -hmm. we forget about narrative, fake news, etc., and think that actually, uh, in the sense of the uh, military action, the actions remind the war of 1939-1945, uh, 1945. the cover bombing of cities, killing uh, the whole villages, bombing the towns, etc. At the same time, drones are used by both sides, and uh, people are checked for their tattoos and for their smartphones. Okay, I never got any tattoos. I'm glad for that, at least. Um, uh, what I wanted to ask also, uh, if to uh, talk a little bit more about the culture war, I know that uh, in the occupied parts of Ukraine, uh, Russia is really trying to uh, re-educate, uh, especially the young, the, the children, the young. Tell us a little bit about what's happening there. They are taking over the schools. Well, in the schools, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, there were commissions created everywhere to confiscate from the school libraries uh, Ukrainian school books and books by Ukrainian authors. And uh, the photos of these protocols about books being uh, removed, uh, I mean, they are available now also on Facebook. Uh, the new school books were written and partially printed in Russia for Ukraine but apparently they were not fully delivered. And in the new history books, actually there is no mention of Kiev and Rus. Which is, of course, totally crazy because uh, anyone who studied a little bit of, of the history of these, these countries, they know that everything started in Kiev. Yeah. Uh, but and I think it was I actually the, the, the Swedes that were there. And well, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I will tell you about this because uh, in, the, in the pandemic years, I think uh, Putin was alone in the bunker and was reading a lot uh, of the books about history. We, and before the pandemic, actually, he was saying that his favorite Tsar was Ivan the Terrible. Maybe because of, of all people, of all people. Yeah, but 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 after pandemic, actually, he started saying that mentioned Peter the Great all the time, and it is strange because I mean he was mentioned Peter the Great who wanted to open Russia to Europe in the time when he was closing Russia to the mm -hmm. world, but then I realized why he was mentioning Peter the Great because Peter the Great was the Tsar during the Poltava battle when Ukrainians together with Swedish army. Uh, and Karl the Twelfth were fighting against Russian army and they lost. And then Ukrainian Gateman Mazepa and the r remnants of his army went to Moldova, to Bessarabia, and then further. So actually, uh, he, uh, in his head, uh, he is also, like Peter the Great, fighting with Ukraine, supported by other countries. The other thing is that Peter the Great, after uh, this victory in Poltava, he issued the first decree banning uh, Ukrainian religious literature in Ukrainian language. This oh. was the first time Ukrainian language was banned. Since then, until 1917, there were more than 40 decrees by different Tsars banning performances in theater in Ukrainian. Uh, Catherine II banned teaching in Ukrainian in Kyiv Mohila Academy in the university, and later the school teaching in Ukrainian was banned. So, so the same is happening now in occupied territories. So teaching in Ukrainian doesn't exist anymore. It's only in Russian. And uh, they are talking about, I don't know if they are preparing already uh, or only planning special re-education camps on Russian territory to re-educate re Ukra uh, Ukrainians and to teach them Russian uh, traditions, Russian folk dances, etc., Russian culture, to, to make them Russians. Well, I am uh, sure this will be not an easy task. And I also know that uh, now also we have had so good news about the turn of the war uh, in also in the east uh, and uh, some in the south also. 
Uh, even if there is also, of course, worrying news of the total mobilization in the, uh, not total, partial no mobilization. Partially uh, total. <laughs> uh, uh, in Russia and also, of course, uh, the so-called referendums, which they are trying to, to uh, legalize, so to speak, their annex annexation of these parts. But uh, what do you think about that? Will they, will they succeed in... in, uh, in uh, I, I'm not sure even if they have real referendums, they're just pretending, yes. Well, they, I mean, they, are not, they cannot be real referendums in the war zone, no. of course, yeah. I mean, they have the data already, I mean, they have the uh, figures they will show in the papers. But, I mean, the people from the occupied territories are telling uh, the journalists, actually, what is happening. Yes, and we had, uh, yesterday, we, have, uh, we were talking a little bit with you about the old Swedish village, which is situated yeah. on the um, uh, west side of the Dniepru, uh, not far from Nova Kachovka, wi which is one of the hot uh, power points right now in the war. They are uh, approximately 40 kilometers from the front, the people in this village. The Swedish um, friend association with the village, they have contact almost every day with the village. And they said that yesterday was there was no referendum there. No one came. Uh, is, it, is it an under occupation? Yes, yes. It's they are under occupation. They yeah. are in Saporos, uh, but in the part, yeah. because they are so close. They are on the beach of yeah. uh, on the on the beach of uh, of Dnipro yeah. and they hear all they they haven't had so many um, Russians are there of course but they haven't been uh, they're not in the in the in the cellars as yeah. they say but but still uh, they're only 40% of the population still there the most of them have have fled yeah. to Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian, free but, Ukraine. But the same, I mean, when they, they had referendum, so-called referendum in Lugansk and Donetsk, yes. I mean, less than half a population will yes. remain there. So yes, and there was no one and, and voting and I yesterday in, uh, or the day before yesterday, the no one voting in uh, Smijivka, the name is in... in yeah, in but, uh, but in general, to, 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 to talk about uh, <laughs> foreign troops coming to another country to organize a referendum. I mean, uh, how, yes, <laughs> how can we discuss it? <laughs> to totally crazy. But still, as, as this uh, guy said, uh, maybe they had a referendum in their heads. Maybe they are still writing it down or registering it as a referendum because yeah. actually no one cares about who voted. They just want the numbers. It's, yeah. it's the so, uh, but you... I mean, the feeling still is that th there has been a turn in the war, and uh, what do you think? The mobilization, will it, th will it affect the war in any way? It can prolong the war just be because of sheer numbers of people who will be sent to front. But these people have no military experience, and mm -hmm. Russia doesn't have enough weapon. And actually, the Russian mobilized uh, citizens are complaining uh, that they are given very old Kalashnikovs. I saw, I saw. Yeah. Rus rusty rusty, things, rusty yes. Kalashnikovs, probably from 1960s, 70s. Uh, that sounds po promising for the Ukrainian side. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I mean, the risk is that, I, or the risk, I think the chance is that uh, all these people coming to Ukraine, maybe they will uh, um, also flee to Ukraine. I mean, uh, because who want? I don't think they well, want I, to I fight. I think they will. There will be a lot of deserters, but I would prefer them to flee somewhere else. Okay. Well, we will see. I hope, I hope they... Uh, the, the, the word now to everyone, I know they're also mobilizing in Crimea and in the occupied but In Crimea, parts. They, are mo they are mobilizing Crimean Tatars. Yes. And they want actually to force Crimean Tatars to fight against Ukrainians in Ukraine. And th this is a very tragic story because, I mean, if, if Crimean Tatars will be killed in the war, there will be even less Crimean Tatars in Crimea. And this is what Russia wants to do. I mean, they deported people who disagreed with annexation. They are, pu they are putting in, in jail uh, people who stay and disagree. I mean, like now there are 13 uh, civic journalists in prisons. And uh, on 21st of September, Nariman Jilal, a journalist and a politician, uh, was sentenced to 17 years for an attempt to blow up a small gas pipeline in a village somewhere far away in the middle of Crimea.
So, I mean, they, they are trying to get rid of Crimean Tatars in all possible ways. I must say that it is also very, um, I, I, I get very good feelings when I read about all the partisan activity behind the, the enemy lines. And uh, as I said, there is a language connection also because they are writing the, the letter of E everywhere. You know the letter of the Ukrainian E, which with is uh, E with two dots. Yeah. Uh, and this is a letter that is only in the Ukrainian language uh, l l alphabet. Yeah, and, and recently, actually, several people were detained and arrested for 15 days for listening to Ukrainian song in a restaurant. The restaurant in Crimea was closed yes, down. Yes, I s oh. I mean, this this is well, incredible. Well, the language is obviously very touchy subject, language and culture. Uh, I mean, in, in Belarus now, there are some arrests also just for speaking Belarusian. Yeah. So that's what, and you Ukrainians, you know that this is what you're fighting for. This is what's coming if you, I don't say if, because you will win, but if you shouldn't fight and let them win, as some people think. Well, th this is the war against Ukrainian mentality yes. and identity. And actually, because of Ukrainian mentality, this individualism, Ukrainians were punished in the Soviet times uh, in masses. Mm. I mean, uh, 300,000 Ukrainian farmers were deported to Siberia because they didn't want to join collective farms. And the artificial hunger of 1932-33, when all the food and all the crops were taken away from Ukrainian peasants and sent to Volga region where there was a real hunger. I mean, this was all punishment for Ukrainians to, to, to be so different from Russians. We will now, uh, in a couple of minutes, we will take a small break and move to the tea corner. I don't know if you saw this, but a uh, little further down here, there is some seating and a uh, uh, heat water heater, and we can make some tea. And for those who want to talk a little bit more uh, with uh, Andre, we will continue the talk for a bit. Uh, but I have one last question. I know that you ha also have a talk in uh, a little later about hatred, about how to control hatred. And this is not my question, but you will develop that with Stefan, who is talking with you then. But I am really worried about, after this war, how we should, because there's hatred also on the Russian side, a lot of hatred. They have, they have nurtured the hatred against Ukraine. Uh, and I'm so worried what will happen with this. Um, how, can, how can we, how, is it even possible to overcome all this hatred? Oh, it takes time. I mean, uh, in 1972, I was 11 years old. I was in the school and I was given a choice between Russia, uh, English and German as a foreign language. And I said that I will never learn German because mm -hmm. they killed my grandfather. So, yes. I mean, uh, I learned German when I was 36. Yes. And it takes time. It does, but still, I mean, we... Uh, for me, the, I mean, mm. the, the major issue is the hatred inside the country, because, yeah. you, I mean, people are looking for enemies inside now. Yeah. Because, I mean, people who are not on the front line, who are in Facebook, for example, and they are trying to control who says what and then decides who is anti-Ukrainian or who has doubts in victory, etc. And, and this is much more dangerous for the society. Yes, of course. And uh, you and your uh, members of the Pen Club and all your colleagues in Ukraine, you have a really important uh, task. I know the, you are not like activists, you are your creators, you are your storytellers, you are your journalists and so on. But still, you play an absolutely central role in keeping the culture and keeping the, the word free. So thank you for, for thank this you talk. Thank, thank you. you. And thank we you. will move to to the tea corner. Thank you.